Mike. Mike. Thank you. Hey, my name is Mike Cope, and uh, while I get this set up, I just want to echo uh, what Repair said this morning about thanking Forever Healthy for putting on this show. I think this has been a spectacular inaugural event. It's been really fun. And I also want to say uh, thank you for giving me a chance to get back to Europe again. Uh, it's been since COVID for me, so having a great time, so thanks. Uh, my name's Mike Cope. I am the co-CEO with Oki O'Connor of Cyclarity Therapeutics. Am I on? I should be. Thank you. Sorry for that delay. Right. Uh, we are a California company, so we talk to more lawyers than most people. Um, <laughs> So we'll start with our disclaimer statement about forward-looking statements, and uh, you are going to hear some forward-looking statements today, so please hang on to your hats. Um, but I want to do this in two parts. I want to tell you a bit of a company story, so for those of you who know me and know the company, this is going to be a little bit of a review session. And then in the second part of this presentation, I want to tell you about what's going on today and what's going on tomorrow. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about the history. Oki O'Connor and Mia Anderson and I started this company in 2019, but it was based on a project that had already been going on at SENS Research Foundation for a couple of years. Uh, by the way, Oki uh, and Mia, that's the science background. I am not a bench scientist, and everybody who knows me knows that I'm not capable of pretending to be a bench scientist. Um, but what we put together at that time was a business plan for a really simple, really modest idea. We were just going to repurpose a really well-known and safe pharmaceutical excipient, a carrier drug, so that it could be an active drug effective in itself. And we were going to take that drug and reverse and cure the world's biggest killer. And indirectly, uh, we were going to change the entire paradigm for how we develop, regulate, and treat all age-related disease. Um, so with our tongue firmly in our cheek. We called ourselves underdog pharmaceuticals when we launched. Um, and uh, we knew we were out to do a lot, but we kind of liked the American sentiment at the time of the little guy that's going to win in the end. So here's your problem statement. Uh, why haven't we licked the world's most lethal disease? Atherosclerosis is just a buildup of plaque in blood vessels. It's by far the world's biggest killer. Um, by far, if you risk adjust heart attack, stroke, COPD for things that have as their actual root cause for the event, uh, atherogenesis, we're talking about maybe as many as 44 out of 100 deaths in the world from everything, including bus accidents. Uh, and despite that severity, and despite the fact that we're now approaching, I think, trillions of dollars that we're spending on this, uh, this disease annually, uh, there's still shockingly little we're doing about it. We're giving you statins and PCSK9 inhibitors to slow down the rate of progression of the disease. Or we can give you blood thinners or some blood pressure me medication, and it's designed to stave off the deleterious events that are going to result from having the disease. Or worse, uh, we do invasive heart surgery, or we simply try to teach your mom how to deal with the consequences of a stroke, and that's what we call disease management today. So our solution, and the key to our success so far, is, is recognizing that there's a core driver of diseases like atherosclerosis. We've known that heart disease is fundamentally driven by toxic oxidized cholesterol derivatives. We've known this since the 1990s. There just hasn't been a lot biologically we could do about it. Oxcol, or oxidized cholesterol, it has no useful biological function. It's not enzymatically created by your body for any purpose. It's impossible for your cells to properly process it. And cell lysosomes can't break it down, so they accumulate and eventually cause cell dysfunction in a variety of arenas. Um, in the cardio system, that happens to macrophages. The, the cardio system is actually a really good self-repair system. There'll be an injury. Monocyte will recruit to an injury. It'll differentiate into a macrophage. It'll then crawl along the artery wall, picking up detritus and cholesterol and processing it. It's either picking up oxcol or it's making the oxcol inside of its cell when it's eating cholesterol. It can't process that, causes it to become dysfunctional, eventually explode into a very unhealthy foam cell 
that foam cell turns into the necrotic core of an atherosclerotic plaque. So the solution to all this really isn't the kind of lipid management that we focus on with drug delivery right now. It's, it's the extraction of the oxidized cholesterol elements, the extraction of the oxidized cholesterol derivatives from those cells. Extraction can protect those macrophages. It can even reverse the foam cell state of macrophages in the plaque. And that should allow the plaque, uh, the cardiovascular self-repair mechanism to kick back in. The necrotic core should become healthy macrophages again, rendering us able to eat the plaque from the inside. Our idea is that firemen have become arsonists. We need to turn the arsonists back into the firemen so that they can clean up the problem they're causing. Uh, so the last several years, we've built and tested a molecule that'll do just that. Uh, that extraction, uh, it's based on a very well-known molecule. It's called cyclodextrin. These are, uh, I guess what we'd say, gigantic small molecules. The smallest are around 1,000 molecular weight. Uh, they're, poly car they're carbon ring polysaccharides. They have a hydrophobic core, but a hydrophilic exterior. So they're really good as carrier molecules for drugs. Uh, they're very safe, so they're used all the time as excipients. And they're used in other products like, uh, like odor eaters that'll drag smelly molecules out of the air and into your carpeting. So if you've sprayed some Febreze today, or if you've taken any of 100 drugs, you probably have some of this in you already. Um, but for all those uses, they haven't really been engineered to be tailored to the target. So that's what we did. Uh, we engineered a special form by decorating the molecule with controlled substitutions so that it was shaped to prefer the ox call. And then we dimerized it into a pair so it captures oxidized cholesterol sort of like a cup and a cap and hangs onto it very tightly. You're watching a, a, a computer simulation, actually, not an animation right up there. We maximized its affinity and specificity for the ox call and minimized its cholesterol impact and impact on other off-target effects. Um, the presentation I'm going to show you from here is mostly an asset pitch about UDP-003, our primary drug candidate. But I want to say a couple of words about the platform that helped us get us here. Um, <clears throat> this first part is called Candy Mer because sugar dimers, I guess. Um, psych synthetic chemistry for cyclodextrins is really promising, uh, but it's also really expensive and really, really time consuming. Uh, so we built a discovery tool that can model cyclodextrins and run virtual experiments. Uh, you can measure, you can do complex measurements of potential mean force and molecular dynamic combination between uh, potential forms of cyclodextrin and potential targets, but you can also run these simple and very broad-based docking analysis with these tools so that you can test a variety of candidates against hundreds of possible on-target and potential off-target effects. Uh, we have uh, some mock-ups in a virtual environment that Mia Anderson, who's here today, uh, standing by our table during most of the breaks. If you want to go over there, wear the Oculus helmet, get a feel for what it feels like to pick up a cyclodextrin molecule, put it all together, <clears throat> and then tell Mia it's a simple job. You don't know why it's so complicated for her. Um, that'd be fine. <clears throat> um, basically, you can input cyclodextrin forms and targets and hopefully extract hopeful drug candidates. Uh, this has been done in protein engineering for some time, but never before introduced into the cyclodextrin environment until Mia, working with uh, two founders of a company called Medusa, some of the world's best computational modelers in the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, uh, got together and started creating this system. Uh, Mia is now doing her doctoral work there, as, my, as a matter of way. So, Go see that table run by her. So that's where we began, uh, that, simple, that simple business strategy. So let me tell you where we are today. Um, first, we're, we're not claiming we're the underdogs anymore. We announced the name change about four months ago because we are now exactly at that transition stage to a real clinical stage company. So this is really the three-point message for Cyclarity right now. First. The drug looks very much like, according to our mechanism of action, it's working very successfully, and it's very, very safe. Uh, secondly, it's on a remarkably accelerated uh, clinical path, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Um, even 
faster than Oki and I had dared hope when we started this company. Um, and finally, because it's the first true disease-modifying drug in this space, it's really a uniquely disruptive market potential. Uh, first, the slides I'm going to show you, uh, the next couple of slides, these are really just representative pieces of data. There's a wealth of repeatable data in our diligence reports here, hundreds of pages of this stuff. I just want to give you a little flavor of it because the data's been panning out really well. <clears throat> We already knew prior to this year that we could protect cells from oxcall poisoning by delivering our drug to a variety of cells. And we had clearly established also that we were getting to the target. We know we can pull oxcall right out of a plaque environment, so the calcification and other structures in plaque are not really impediment to what we're doing. And we also know we can pull it right out of the diseased cells themselves, either out of the cell or off the cell membrane in a way that's reducing overall oxcall concentration within the cell. We're not just taking it out of the surrounding serum. But more directly to that root uh, mechanism cause, the core driver of the disease itself, uh, disease foam cells in a necrotic uh, plaque, they're sort of quasi-senescent. They're supposed to eat phagocytose, but they don't. They're not dead. They're not functional. They exude these oxcalls like a distress signal, recruiting other healthy macrophages to the site. They become sick. You get this whole non-virtual cycle. And now we've established that when we treat even these severely diseased foam cells with 003, we can recover their phagocytosis function and sort of reclaim them from that zombie-like state. Again, just representative pieces of data, but the bottom line is this. <clears throat> we can take those half-dead uh, foam cells sickened on a cholesterol or an ox call diet, uh, and simply make them look like recovered, functional, and healthy macrophages again. So that data, extraction from cells in a plaque environment, reverting the foam cell state, suggests we can rehabilitate the necrotic core of a plaque, or in other words, uh, we really did turn that arsonist back into a fireman. Um, and we can do this within a really broad uh, dose range, too. There's, a, a, there's generic cyclodextrin that's being pursued in an in a orphan disorder called neiman pick c uh, and it might be considered for some athero work as well, but, but they have some very extreme dosing issues, and one of the problems is that they're chasing cholesterol, or at least they think they are. Um, and now that we've designed a drug to target just the ox call, it's, it's in fact very hard to get us to toxic levels. We've run the entire safety profile in animals in a non-GLP setting. And right now, we're about a third of the way through doing this in the good laboratory practice environment that's going to be required to get us into clinical trials next year. Uh, and everything looks fine right now. So far, we expect no surprises whatsoever. Uh, in fact, the regulatory preps have gone, this is probably a knock on wood part of the presentation, uh, they've gone remarkably well. And over the last year and a half, a couple of really good things have happened for us. First, uh, last year, we wanted to get an early regulatory meeting so that we went to the UK to do a scientific advice meeting. And you do that because you can get earlier meetings and more frequent meetings in the UK than you are usually allowed to do in the FDA and the IND program. <clears throat> um, we wanted to do a little testing on our manufacturing issues, get some feedback on safety and efficacy. And we scored very well in that meeting. We thought we really held our end up really well. And as a result of it, a couple of members in that meeting on their side invited us to apply to what was at the time the brand new innovative licensing and access pathway. So we slipped in an application with a little humility, knowing that Merck was the first company to get it. Um, and Underdog, now Cyclarity, was somewhere between the seventh or tenth uh, company to be awarded an innovation passport under that program. Um, What's going to happen now is this gives us access to absolutely every UK agency that's involved in healthcare and healthcare strategy. Um, and they're going to help with clinical planning. We're working with them on developing a roadmap, which should accelerate our entry into clinic. They're going to help with us with rolling and continuous clinical review as we march through the clinic. And there's even a possibility under this program that you can do an adaptive licensing sort of reimbursement approach with the NHS in phase three clinical trials. So the phase three clinical trials that you run in the UK may be to some extent considered marketed drugs. Um, 
There's about 100 programs and uh, drugs in that program right now, but compared to the four or 5,000 CTAs that have been delivered to the UK over the same period, it's still a pretty big get for a small company like, a, like us. Second issue is we wanted to get a chance not just to do tox and dosimetry in early phase trials. We really wanted a chance to measure potential for real effective signal, either reduction of inflammation or reduction of plaque itself. And the MHRA has not only been agreeable to the strategy, they have actually been pushing on us a little bit to have this strategy. They asked us to include, even in phase one, patients with a normal atherosclerotic load for their age, and we're gonna include a wide age range in there. So we're gonna get some atherosclerosis patients or patients, subjects with atherosclerosis in that trial. And then in phase two, we're gonna have 100 dose patients with CAD, so it'll be 150 patients overall, three cohorts, two of them dosed, um, giving us a, a, a large scale of patients to look at. This is gonna be coronary artery disease without any pre-existing major cardiac event having occurred, but that still from our classification is a very good patient to be looking at for plaque load to see if you can do something with inflammation or plaque reduction. So we'll be doing some very useful CT angio imaging in the phase two program, and we'll be able to look, if not in phase one, definitely in phase two, to have a significant opportunity to really see some meaningful um, signal events going on in these trials. Now, nothing is gonna be statistical at this stage. That's not what phase twos are about. But if we can show any signal at all going on, I think the sky is gonna be the limit for cyclarity after that. <clears throat> So here's where we stand. We've, uh, we've raised about $14 million so far. That'll get us through middle to late next year to the filing of our IMPD, which is the United Kingdom equivalent of the US IND. We'll do our whole phase one in the UK and then the phase two in Europe, UK, and the United States. Um, we'll complete our GLP safety testing before the middle of next year. We've already had four regulatory meetings. We had the UK SAM, we had the UK ILAP application and the ILAP kickoff. And earlier this year, we did the US uh, pre-IND uh, and we've done swimmingly on all of them. So we really think we're in good shape. And we could go as fast as having all clinical data under this ILAP program by early 2025, starting from today. We are reeling from the shock of how fast we're moving along at Site Clarity since we started about three years ago. <clears throat> uh, finally, we've done uh, all our engineering work that it's gonna be used in the GLP studies. Uh, and Kayvon just confirmed that we can announce that we are commencing our production of the actual CGMP grade human clinical trial material. The stuff we're gonna use in the human clinicals the production has started in China today, started this morning. So, thank you. <laughs> <Back up. laughs> so here's where the world stands. Everything we do in Athero that we call preventative is really lipid management designed to slow down rate of dying of the disease. Everything we call protective is really just trying to stave off the results of that disease. And everything else going on in cyclodextrins is not engineering the molecule to what we think the real target and the real target problem is. And as far as we can tell, attacking that target is the only hope we have to get to real disease modification. Um, so in that context, I wanna take a minute to make a couple of market points, but by the way, this is not in any way an advanced breakdown of a bottom-up market analysis. If you wanna see my naive attempts at that, talk to me after class. Um, but before I say anything about this, I wanna scratch that out and say, there's a mission drive of this company that was organized by people that all came out of a nonprofit medical institution designed to ensure broad access to technologies like this. Our goal internally is we're successful when we've saved one billion lives. But yeah, we gotta pay for it. <clears throat> um, and I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Despite the lack of any disease-modifying drugs out there, this market is growing, this, the, the lipid management market is growing, and it's growing pretty strongly. Uh, this may be a, a little bit of a liberal expectation, but some of the analyses will say this market is gonna be as strong as $60 billion a year. We can do an awful lot with a small share of that market. Um, 
and, and the CAGR on that is actually pretty strong, even though we've had the introduction of generics over the last, uh, of the last many years. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity for a real preventative to actually gain even more market share. There's a recent Swedish study that was pointed out to me a few days ago that suggests that as many as 42% of adults over 40 years old who have no history or diagnosis of any cardiovascular disease at all are still carrying around a significant and measurable atherosclerosis load. So this is one of those situations where we're all sick of this disease in more ways than one. Um, I just, that pun was accidental, I'm sorry. Uh, and the global costs are getting into the trillions. And again, uh, we, our parents, our grandparents, we're just getting sicker from this. At Cyclarity, I think we think this is probably the most definitive example of modern medicine providing us with sick care and without any opportunity for real health care. And what this all means, though, when you put it all together, is that if you can introduce something that can really do something about reversing disease, you can supplement and eventually change standard of care without ever needing to directly challenge standard of care. We don't need to draw off standard of care in order to, to introduce UDP-003 to market. You can keep on these ameliorative strategies as much as you want until the efficacy of a reversal drug simply becomes so overwhelming that you realize you don't need this other stuff anymore. Uh, so without any direct challenge, you end up challenging. I, I call it constructive market disruption or something like that. Uh, but I think it gives us an overwhelmingly huge opportunity to make a big difference here. Um, I'm getting close. I'm going to wrap it up with a couple of perifer peripheral slides. Our use of funds in the next round is going to be about what you'd expect, mostly in clinical for phase one and two, and then a lot in manufacturing because it's a kind of a difficult manufacturing process. Um, That'll be somewhere around the $30 million mark to get to the end of phase two, which carries us to early to mid-2025. Uh, but even with just a little bit of extra, extra resources, we'll be able to get a lot done in pipeline and platform. Mia's already working with her team in Santiago on building an AI into an iterative uh, cyclodextrin construction program for us. And, um, and another reason that we're going to have some pipeline advantages is that this ox call that's known as 7-keto cholesterol, which is our prime target for athero, is also heavily implicated in Alzheimer's disease, in forms of kidney disease, in forms of liver disease. So even before we have to move to new targets, we'll have a host of repurposing opportunities available for us. Uh, we like that because it means there's no pressure to deviate from a longevity focus. Um, and by the way, we're also exploring an interest you see up there uh, regarding the role of oxidized cholesterol in impeding uh, stroke recovery and causing inflammation that impedes stroke recovery. Um, this might just be an example of a more precise clinical tar target, and I'm just raising that because I know a lot of audience members will be looking at primary CAD, knowing that you have to run a MACE trial or massive cardiac event trial in such circumstances. That's a really big ask for a little company like us. We haven't shied away from big asks so far. Um, but if we have to do that, there's an opportunity for us to do something more limited and then follow up with label expansion later. Uh, we have two great patent groups. These aren't minor formulations. There's 50,000 patents in the space, but nobody does API engineering. So we expect broad coverage over the compositions that we're working on uh, and enough to cover the market. Um, and just as an introduction, our group includes Jay Jerome, the guy who helped us write our 7KC paper, Leho Sente, possibly the world's most famous expert on cyclodextrins, and Phil Lavin, uh, who is a very well-known biostatistician. He's got about 80 FDA approvals under his belt. And he was the guy who was one of the primary stra uh, strategists on Lipitor. And we've just introduced Dr. Noah Rosenberg, who's also joined us today. He's got some deep CV experience. And as part of our big transition into this clinical stage company, he has just joined us as head of clinical affairs. So please introduce yourself to him. Uh, I hope you enjoyed some of this. I know it was a little rushed. I, I think we are really on the cusp of something really special, not just us, all of rejuvenation biotechnology. I think Cyclarity is going to be a big part of that. And that's my talk. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Mike. You really have to succeed to the benefit for all of us. <laughs> yeah, that's the question. Please go ahead. Fantastic, Mike. Congratulations. Thanks. Clinical trials. It's over there. Hey. Clinical trials. Yeah. So the big thing about uh, this patient group is to prove it out, you have to have a huge patient population. So once you get beyond two, there's this enormous investment and time required. How, how do you plan to deal with this? Like, you know, they're saying a billion dollars to do these, these scale of thousands of, of patients. So how, how do you plan to deal with that? It's a, 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 it's a large question. I'll give you a couple of potential answers for it right now. Uh, but we can talk about it a lot more uh, offline. But um, yeah, right now you have to run what's called a MACE trial to do something in cardio. And I think it's actually chilling a lot of cardio investment, even among the big guys. And one of the problems with that is everything else has been so incremental. If you're introducing CETP or PS, PCSK9 on top of statins, it's hard to show that incremental advantage. So first of all, if the reason why we're still pursuing primary CAD is we're hoping that if we can show something that's actually showing reversal, we might have a chance to have a lot more signal within a more limited bandwidth. Uh, but yeah, MACE trial is a really expensive and really hard event, so we are also keeping strategies open to do more limited label ex and then expansion into that if we have to. Um, and finally, we are working as hard as we can on looking at whether we can introduce other diagnostic tools into these clinical systems that can help us evaluate the progress of these patients and the relationship between what might eventually become biomarkers or companion diagnostics downstream to what's happening. Um, we've got some allies in there, by the way. The, the, one of the advisors on, on one of the regulatory groups, although everybody still says you need a MACE trial, had himself written a paper saying, you got to do a MACE trial, and that sucks, uh, basically. So um, we can give you some, some sites on that. Jürgen? I'm very intrigued by your, um, let's say, the mechanism of action. I have a question with regard to your early trials. Do you believe that independent of the histology of these plugs, that your drug works in every plug the same way? So, for example, if you have a 70, 80 percent stenosis and others have just a 40 percent stenosis, I think the histology of these plugs might not be homogeneous. Yeah. So, do you have any data? And how do you ensure that, especially in your early trials, where it's absolutely let's say mandatory to, that you show an efficacy that you have a homogeneous black population, so to say. Yeah, that, thank you. Uh, first of all, you're, you're getting very close to one of those science questions that I'm going to get <laughs> say I'm not the bench guy to answer. Uh, but I, I think our uh, general philosophy for our company is that what we're trying to do is rehabilitate a self-repair function in the cardiovascular system. So it's not like we're trying to come into a late stage culprit plaque and then just kick it apart and cause all sorts of damage. If you can get the self repair mechanism to start working again, it should start to release those problems in a much more natural way. And as a matter of fact, this overloading process with these macrophages takes quite a bit of time. So if you can rehabilitate them, you can probably set that process in motion, even if it may take years. And we're hoping that our treatment regimen is going to be a treatment regimen and then a number of years before you need a treatment regimen again. Uh, so it wouldn't be, like, uh, wouldn't be quite like Roto-Rooter where you're just going to come in and grind everything up and, and loose it out there. Okay, thank you. All the other questions I would like to uh, uh, trans transfer to the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for your talk. Thank you.